Hello, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, we're happy to have you with us. Our special guest today, Dr. Uh, Jawad Ahmad, who is a professor of medicine in the Reconati Miller Transplantation Institute at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where he has been studying biliary complications after liver transplantation, PSC, uh, and drug-induced liver injury, which is what he's going to be talking to us about today. He's the co-director and co-primary investigator of the NIH-sponsored Mount Sinai Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network since 2013. Dr. Ahmad, welcome. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so um, let me share my screen. Uh, you can see my screen? Mm, not, not yet. Not yet. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay, very good. All right, and let me just switch this into, yep, exactly. Perfect. Uh, okay, so um, as, uh, as Dr. Weissman mentioned, so this, this talk will be about drug induced liver injury. Um, my name's uh, Joad Ahmad. I do this in conjunction with my co director, Dr. Joseph Odin, uh, and uh, we're both at the, the main campus. So um, I have no disclosures. So just to give you an outline, we'll, we'll talk about uh, drug-induced liver injury and, and what the DILI network does. Uh, we'll talk about epidemiology, uh, a little bit about genetics and causality, and then maybe in the last 10, 15 minutes, we'll talk about herbal and dietary supplements. So we, we talk about drug-induced liver injury, uh, but this can be from prescription drugs, but also from things that people take, which they won't necessarily classify as drugs, uh, because there's some interesting data on this. So we'll start with the case. So this is uh, unfortunately a real case. This is a 28 year old male, uh, comes with several weeks of kind of initially non-specific symptoms, um, some weakness, maybe fatigue, uh, but then gets dark urine pale stool and he gets jaundiced. No real past medical history, except um, he was overweight and he was trying to lose weight by taking, uh, by exercising, watching his diet, but also taking multiple uh, herbal and dietary supplements. And they were working uh, because he lost 120 pounds over six months. Uh, he's a smoker, no alcohol, no drugs. When you examine him, uh, he's uh, jaundiced, uh, but he was alert and orientated. Uh, no liver flap, his abdomen was soft and no hepatosplenomegaly. So his initial labs are shown here. Um, the workup for Acute hepatitis was negative in terms of viral markers, autoimmune markers, metabolic uh, markers. Uh, and you can see he's got a, a severe injury with jaundice, right? So he has an ALT and an AST of 1,500 or so, uh, really no uh, alkaline phosphatase, but live evidence of uh, liver synthetic dysfunction, uh, INR 2.7, creatinine was normal, and his, uh, his, his jaundice, the bilirubin is 33. So um, talk for another day, but this, this qualifies as High's law, High Zimmerman with a, a very eminent liver pathologist. So if you see hepatocellular injury, meaning very high transaminases with jaundice, there's significant mortality associated with that. that that's what High's law says. So this gentleman, uh, we admitted him. Unfortunately, he worsens. Um, his INR rises. He develops a liver flap. We list him uh, for liver transplant as a status one. So that's the, the top priority. Uh, and he thankfully underwent transplant a week later. And on the explant, uh, what you see is what you'd expect, massive hepatic necrosis. Um, and the pathologists say consistent with a history of drug-induced liver injury. Now, I take that with a grain of salt. Anybody who's a, any pathologist listening, uh, we can talk about that offline. But I'm not certain you can actually say that, that uh, someone has uh, drug-induced liver injury just on a liver biopsy. Uh, the patient actually did well after transplant. Um, and uh, he, when he did uh, get better, eventually he brought in his weight loss program. Uh, so these are all the things that he was taking. So maybe 15 or 20 different compounds. And of those compounds, they're going to have maybe 20, 30 ingredients. And we'll talk a little bit about it later on about, well, how do you decipher which of these compounds was the thing that caused his uh, liver injury? Can you actually do that? Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on. So the, the DILI network 
is uh, been around for almost 20 years now. So this is uh, an NIH funded U01 cooperative agreement. So that basically means that you take uh, centers throughout the country, uh, similar to Mount Sinai, uh, who are interested in this and um, have PIs at each one. And then we, we essentially collaborate, we collect uh, the, the cases. So the main aims are to advance understanding and research into idiosyncratic DILI. I highlighted idiosyncratic because this is not um, we're, we're not really interested in, for instance, uh, uh, acetaminophen liver injury. Right? So acetaminophen is a predictable liver injury. Uh, you take too much of it, you're going to get liver injury from it. We're interested in idiosyncratic, right? So that means there's really no, no rhyme or reason why this person got this injury from this drug at this time. Uh, there's a prospective registry. So this is patients that obviously we've, we're collecting as the injury happens. Also a retrospective arm to the study. Um, which hasn't recruited that many, but let's say you have a patient that, that you knew 10 years ago was transplanted and had a liver injury from eyes and eyes, let's say. We're also interested in trying to standardize kind of the nomenclature for this, right? So if, this isn't a, a, an area where there's a blood test that can prove the patient has Billy. So making a diagnosis and establishing causality, that's quite difficult. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so... In, in, in the 20 years, I would say that there, there has been some progress made in, in these kind of aims. So currently we're on the, the fourth iteration. There, there will be a fifth um, starting hopefully 2023. And the sites are listed there. So um, kind of northeast preponderance, uh, although a little bit of Midwest, you can count in Indiana and, uh, and Michigan, and then one, one site over in the, on the West Coast with USC, UCLA. The aims of this iteration, right? So this is the way the way these UO1 studies work is that you get funding for five years. So uh, this is the fourth iteration. So for it's 2018 to 2023. So essentially expand the registry of patients that we already have, identify kind of risk factors, clinical risk factors, but also maybe genetic risk factors. Now, this is something that will be very important, hopefully going forward, is that if you can identify why this person got this injury from this drug because they have a genetic risk for it, that would be very useful. Uh, maybe there's an intervention that we can try, right? So some of these injuries are actually pretty severe. Um, is it worth trying something to treat Dilly? Uh, so we have a study which hopefully will start soon on that. And then another thing that we're, that we're, we're in usefully positioned to do would be pharmacovigilance. And I'll show you one example of that, meaning particularly with the herbal dietary supplements, right? So these things, new compounds are, are, are coming onto the market all the time. What about um, a new compound that comes and then is suddenly causing liver injury? Maybe we can be a bellwether to pick up these injuries before they become a real problem in, 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 a, in a bigger patient population. So I'll, I'll give you one example of that a little bit later. So in terms of what we currently have recruited, this is like a little bit old, but the N is written up there. So we have about, maybe 23, 2,500 patients so far uh, that we've got uh, clinical data on. We have uh, stored sera and we have uh, very good characterization. So these are all patients that had a, a drug-induced liver injury. So in terms of kind of just uh, demographics, you can see there, they're kind of middle-aged, a little bit of a female predominance, um, mainly Caucasian. That's something to do with, we, we joined the, the cooperative agreement a little bit later but like Indiana or Michigan and places like that typically will have Caucasian patients. These patients are actually quite sick, right? So I'll show you a slide a little bit later. When we talk about Dilly, there's like this whole spectrum, right? You can have patients that have just kind of mild abnormalities of LFTs, but other patients like the case in this particular uh, uh, presentation who had a very severe injury, he was jaundiced, right? So we have a, a tendency to recruit patients that are a little bit sicker than you may, may anticipate just with a, a regular delete because two thirds of our patients are joined. Sometimes there's a fever and rash, maybe there's an immunologic uh, uh, phenomenon going on here. And then the pattern of injury is useful. So we split it into what we classify as hepatocellular, telostatic and mixed, right? So the initial injury that I showed you in this case, this was a hepatocellular, right? You had to provide a very high transaminase, but sometimes you can get an injury where the alkaline phosphatase is elevated rather than the ALT and AST. And sometimes it's, there's a mixed picture and there's a, there's a ratio that you can actually use to calculate that. And that's useful because some drugs give you a certain pattern of injury. Um, some more characteristics. So again, as I mentioned, there's a whole spectrum of, of illness. So the ALT and AST and alkaline phosphatase, I'll show you at the onset of the injury. And sometimes 
later on they get worse, right? So sometimes the patient, we pick up the injury and they're, they're, they're a little bit jaundiced, but they get more jaundiced and the injury uh, gets worse. And this doesn't have uh, an entirely benign outcome. You would think that, well, this is a liver injury. You, you, you get a little bit jaundiced, you get liver enzymes that are elevated, you stop the drug, the patient gets better. Most of the time that happens, but sometimes it doesn't, right? So here's outcome measures. 7% uh, of the population die, right? Now, you can argue, well, that's kind of a little, that's high, but maybe that's not a true figure because some of the deaths occurred for other reasons, right? So some, some patients had cancer and were on a chemotherapy drug that caused DILI, but they ended up dying of the cancer, not the DILI, right? So of the 7% death that we see, about half are liver-related, right? So maybe 3.5%. So again, that it's a high figure, it's a, a bit of a concern, but it also speaks to the fact that we tend to recruit patients who are, who are sicker. We tend not to recruit patients that have a kind of a milder injury. And you can see that because most of the patients that we recruit are admitted to the hospital and some of them end, end up getting transplanted. Now, uh, chronic DILI is a talk for another day, but this is important. What it shows is that some patients, they get an injury that's an acute injury. The drug has incited some sort of uh, injury to the liver, but it doesn't get better, meaning they stop the drug but six months later, they still have evidence of liver injury. And we also have fiber scan data on this as well. Uh, and as I mentioned, I talked another day, but the figure to remember is that maybe a fifth, so maybe 20% of patients uh, will get chronic, disease, meaning an injury that does not get better. As I mentioned, we're interested in idiosyncratic DILI uh, because they're, they're, they're the things where uh, the injury is not predictable. So it affects only uh, it's an uncommon injury. It affects patients that are presumably sus genetically susceptible. Uh, it's not really dose dependent or it's less dose dependent. It, it probably is a little bit dose dependent in the sense that the more you take, the more likely it is to happen, but it can happen even with a low dose. And the clinical course is more variable, meaning uh, as we know with acetaminophen, you overdose on acetaminophen. It's a very predictable response what's going to happen uh, as opposed to with idiosyncratic DILI. Chronic DILI already talked about latency is important. It means the time from when you started the drug to when the liver injury happened, right? So this is important because is it reasonable to think that you've been on a drug for a year, let's say, uh, nitrofurantone is a good example, right? Uh, an antibiotic that's used chronically for suppressing UTIs. Can you get a liver injury after you've been on a drug for a year? So the latency is important. How long did it take for the injury to, to appear so that you can assess the causality? The challenge basically means how long did it take for it to get better, right? You stop the drug, how long did it take for the, the enzymes normalized? So let's talk a little bit about epidemiology and risk factors. So I mentioned a little bit earlier, right? You can think about this as a pyramid. Um, so if you talk about DILI as being kind of elevated liver enzymes on a drug, it's going to be millions and millions of people. So the best example is maybe statins, right? Statins are well known to cause mild elevation of liver enzymes, whether that's clinically relevant or not. Uh, is, is open to debate. But as you go up the pyramid, you're going to start getting patients who are uh, sicker, but there'll be a lot less of those, like the patient that I just pr presented, who can get jaundice with liver injury, but then also get acute liver failure and then die, right? So if you look at some of the figures, just if you if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, it's millions of people every year. And I'll show you some, some data from other countries as well. Um, but if you look at the top of the pyramid, thankfully, it's going to be a lot less. Uh, but if you look at hospital admissions, right? So for us uh, over in uh, China, we have three liver services, right? So we have a pre-liver service, a post-liver service, and we have a consult service. I would say more than half of the patients that we see in the consult service are abnormal LFTs, right? In an orthopedic patient or in a cardiac patient. And most of those are going to be uh, DILI. And that's backed up by data showing that a lot of hospital admissions, not alone what we see on the consult service, a few percent of hospital admissions are probably DILI. If you extrapolate that to patients that have bad liver injury, acute liver failure, get transplanted, it's several hundred patients every year. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the, the highs law. It's caused by prescribed drugs, but the, the overland dietary stuff is something that is topical. And we're seeing a, a greater incidence, I would say, in the last uh, decade or two, because more people are using these things. There are already specific kind of risk drug associations, right? So we know that, for instance, INH is, is an age-related thing, right? You guys will know even better than me, maybe, that uh, there's, there's kind of an age cutoff for latent TB when you should be using INH. 
There's a similar thing with valproate. It's kind of an in, a, a drug that you've got to be aware of in the pediatric population. And there are other risk factors, gender, more, more women are likely to get diclopenac injury, obesity, pregnancy, HIV, polypharmacy probably plays a role. So the more drugs you're on, so that means the elderly patients. And then SIP uh, status also uh, is a risk factor for certain uh, drugs and clearly. There are other things that you can look at to predict Dili, other than just like cytochrome people 50 status. So are there specific polymorphisms that you can identify for certain drugs? So there are. So I've listed some of them here. Um, and then I'll show you some, some GWAS studies. So essentially what this means is that if you have uh, this particular polymorphism, it increases your risk of an injury from this drug X fold. So for instance, here, uh, HLA, that seems obvious, right? HLA is part of our immune system. If you have polymorphisms in HLA, and remember there's lots of different HLA haplotypes, um, it, it makes sense then when you do these GWAS plots, these Manhattan plots, that you'll see a spike on chromosome six, right? So this is for two different drugs, flucloptocillin is an antibiotic used in Europe, and tabinafine in a, a, an antifungal agent. You can see there's a, a spike, a red spike that's seen on chromosome six corresponds to the HLA gene. So HLA B5701, uh, increases your risk, risk 80 times of having an injury from fluproptocillin. And similarly, A3301 increases your risk 76 times uh, with tabinafine. Uh, this is clinically useful data, but remember, these are injuries that are not that common. So even though it increases your risk 70 to 80 fold, is that enough to be doing genetic testing on anybody before you give them tabinafine? Probably not, right? Because it's still going to be a pretty uncommon event. We've also been working on not just HLA associations, but other genes that may uh, influence your immune response to this particular drug. So for instance, this PTPN22 is a, is a gene uh, that codes for a protein tyrosine phosphatase that's expressed in lymphoid tissue. But if you look at this uh, gene and look at polymorphisms in this gene, it affects responsiveness from B and T cells, and it therefore is involved in various kind of autoimmune type diseases. So I've shown on this cartoon, it's associated with things that you typically think are obviously autoimmune disease, Addison's disease, Hashimoto, Graves' disease, myasthenia, et cetera, but also Dili. So we published on this uh, recently. Um, so this is in gastro from a couple of years ago. So it shows that you can see the spike on chromosome six that corresponds to the HLA. So this is uh, uh, 2000 cases of Dili. And you can see there's also a spike on chromosome one uh, that corresponds to this PTPN22 gene. So what does this actually do? Well, I'll give you one example. So augmentin is a commonly used antibiotic that we see uh, drug-induced liver injury from pretty commonly. So if you look at augmentin, there are HLA risk factors for augmenting liver, uh, liver injury, but also this PTPN22, it seems to augment, deliberate pun, uh, the, the risk of getting liver injury from augmentin. So I've highlighted in yellow there that if you have DRB1-1501 and A0201, uh, they, they're risk factors for getting augmenting DILI. Not the same as the sets, you know, 70 to 80 fold that was shown in those other two drugs, but maybe an odds ratio of about eight. But if you also have PTPN22, it kind of doubles your risk. Whereas if you don't have the HLA uh, risk factors, the PTN22 doesn't really do anything. So it's a modulator of genetic risk factors. And there's a couple of other things that we've been working on that do similar things. But the, the upshot really is that, yes, going forward, uh, it's not like uh, TPMT, right? So if people use azathioprine, right? When we, we know that um, guidelines, depending on rheumatology or gastroenterology, whoever used those drugs suggest that you should be doing TPMT testing beforehand um, because you, you, you don't want to get uh, neutropenia from, from azathioprine if you use too big a dose. We're not there for dip. Right, so there's no clinical utility yet for doing genetic testing, even for the fluclopsacillin that I showed or for the to, uh, to benefit. INH maybe, right? INH we know is a pretty uh, common cause of drug-induced liver injury, and maybe it would be worthwhile doing in that patient population if you could identify HLA risk factors. But in general, the, the incidence of Billy is too low to be doing it based on what it would cost of the effort to do all this, but it will change if we have stronger risk factors, and obviously the cost of genome sequencing that goes down uh, uh, pretty much every month. So let's switch to diagnosis. So we have a, a patient that has a, a liver injury. Um, and how do we say, well, yeah, we're, we're pretty certain this is what 
what, what caused it. We sort we think this drug caused it. So one of the things we use is initially, well, how bad is the injury? So you have to look at the, the criteria for a clinically significant event. So in our network, this is what we use, and this is a little bit arbitrary, uh, but uh, most other networks in, in other countries do something very similar. So we look at the, the, the amount the ALT is elevated and how jaundiced the patient is and, and the amount the alkaline phosphate is elevated. So we use five times here. Uh, for ALT, ASD, and two times for, for Alphos, or, um, and 2.5 milligrams per, per uh, deciliter for the, uh, the jaundice, for the, for the bit of rumen. Spoke about this a little bit earlier, the R ratio is important, right? So we, we talk about hepatocellular, colostatic, or mixed, and it basically reflects how high the transaminases are versus the alkaline phosphate. So hepatocellular has predominantly a transaminase elevation, uh, colostatic has predominantly alkaline phosphate elevation and there's a mixed number. So we use the R ratio based on this calculation. The problem is some drugs, yes, classically cause a colostatic injury, but they can also cause a hepatocellular injury. But it's useful to know what was the injury initially. Uh, so you can be, how, how certain can you be about the diagnosis? What we really do though, is we use other tests to exclude other things. And then we'll, if we're left with nothing else, then it's probably due, right? So you want to make sure the patient doesn't have hepatitis uh, a, B, C, or E even. Uh, biliary disease, if it's cholestatic, that makes sense, right? If you have PSC, that can mimic, I suppose, bili. So you should be getting a, a, an MRI. Ischemic congestion is pretty uh, uh, easy to rule out, right? If you're on the, uh, if the patient's had a, a, a AAA repair yesterday and, and now has very high transaminases, it's likely to be ischemia. Alcoholic hepatitis really shouldn't be an issue. I mean, the numbers really don't get that high in the ASD, ALT, plus the history of alcohol. Autoimmune liver disease with the markers, yes. And then you really do need to ask about what did you take, right? The problem with the, with the herbal and dietary things and particularly over-the-counter things is that well, patients don't volunteer that information. So you have to ask, them, okay? We've had a, a couple of cases where people didn't even take anything. They probably inhaled it or it was a topic, topical exposure. Uh, so for instance, hair dye. So you have to really be very, uh, 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 in terms of the history, Maybe the medical student is the best person to, uh, to, to get the history out. What on earth did you get exposed to? It's useful to, ch to check for hepatitis C RNA. That makes sense, right? If a patient has acute hepatitis, you would think, well, maybe they've got a risk factor to get acute hepatitis C. When we've looked at this, patients don't need to have a risk factor. So you need to ask uh, and you need to then test. Hepatitis E, we have a big study looking at this. So we've got stored serum. So when we first started doing the study, we didn't have good testing for HEV. Now we do, so we've gone back and looked, and yeah, not surprisingly, some of these patients we thought had dilly, pretty classic dilly, and yet really it was hepatitis E. Um, and then testing for a kind of atypical viruses, they're, they're pretty uncommon, and usually there'll, there'll be a clinical presentation that will show that. Uh, we talked about doing abdominal imaging. That makes sense, particularly for cholestatic diseases, and uh, maybe less so doing any RCP. We just published this uh, a couple of months ago. What about doing a liver biopsy, right? So... It seems to make sense. If you have a liver injury, you did all the testing, everything's negative, maybe a liver biopsy will help you in determining whether this is dilly. So uh, what we did here is a little bit of a, a difficult study to, to explain, but essentially the, the, the message is this, and I'll just show you the, um, the, the graph. So these are five categories of patients that we see, right? So we, we think this patient had a liver injury. Uh, did we think we were, that the injury was definite, highly likely, probable, possible, or unlikely? So we're using a five-point Likert scale. So basically, uh, definite, highly likely, and probable, we think are dilly, but possible and likely, we don't think are dilly. So the orange bars are prior to the biopsy. So you see the cases kind of cluster in the middle. So we're a little bit on the fence. We're, we're thinking probable, possible, maybe likely. But after the biopsy, it spreads out, meaning a biopsy makes you more definitive in determining whether the patient does have dilly or excluding dilly, right? So sometimes you do it and you think, oh, basically the patient has autoimmune disease and it was a useful biopsy to do because then maybe that leads to steroid treatment, okay? Assessing causality, right? So you, you, you made a diagnosis, but how certain are you that this drug caused the injury? Because sometimes people take more than one drug, right? So if you look at the uh, uh, database, Nine out of the 10 top drugs, right? So the, what are the, the top 10 drugs that we see? Nine of them are antibiotics, right? So antimicrobials are the, the, the drug that usually we think cause the injury when there's a, a cocktail of drugs because it's just more commonly, but that doesn't get into the denominator. Now we have, again, for, for brevity, I didn't include all this, but 
it will be useful to know, well, okay, fine, you have nine drugs that are causing uh, liver injury here in your network, but maybe they're the nine most commonly prescribed drugs, right? Um, so it's not really that common. It's just because it's a, a function of those, those drugs being prescribed so often. It's not, that's not true, actually. Um, if you think about which drugs can cause bile, well, it's basically any drug, right? So I'll show you one slide at the end. If you take nothing else away from this talk, it's going to be the most important one. But if you look in the, the big, you know, the drug reference book that we have, it always says caution liver disease. It always says caution uh, can cause abnormal liver tests. So I take that with a grain of salt. But there are some, some drugs that you've got to be careful with. I'll show you a slide a bit, bit later on. But also the herbal and dietary stuff, right? So if you look at the, 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 the HDS, so for instance, the, the, the compounds this particular patient was taking when I, that I showed you earlier, He's taking so many things, but there are some things that stick out that you really got to be aware of, right? So I've highlighted some of those in yellow there. So green tea extract, we just published on this and this is used by a lot of people. Uh, green tea extract can cause a liver injury and there's a genetic risk factor for it as well. Oxylite Pro has been withdrawn from the market. I'll show you a couple of slides later about how that had legal ramifications, but also things that are, are being used much more commonly now than they were before. So Kraton, which is a kind of a, a, a thing that you can use as a kind of a narcotic kind of replacement. Turmeric, Garcinia, and a bunch of other things that I've listed there. If you look at prescription drugs, this is important because the package insert on these drugs tells you you need to monitor LFTs. So we know about statins, but fluconazole, for instance, or any of the azoles, eyes and eyes, um, we know about right, tonavir, nitrofurantoin, methotrexate, all of these drugs you've got to be uh, careful with uh, because there are legal ramifications if you don't, right? So if someone gets a liver injury and you put them on ketoconazole for a, whatever, athlete's foot or something, and they get dilly from this, this, this is malpractice. Making a diagnosis also relies on, well, what kind of pattern of injury are we seeing? So there are certain drugs that, you know, cause a certain drug injury. So eyes and eyes and the, and the TB drugs are classically cause hepatocellular injury with jaundice. Um, so usually there's not much debate about that. When you see a patient with latent TB on INH have some non-specific symptoms and they two months later is jaundice, it's going to be the INH. Uh, nitrofurantoin and minocycline cause like a autoimmune type hepatitis. So that can sometimes be difficult, right? What, what's the difference between drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis versus de novo autoimmune hepatitis? So we do struggle with that. Uh, and then the antibiotics, particularly augmenting, for instance, causes a cholestatic hepatitis. So again, if you get jaundice with high outflows and you were on augmenting, it was probably the augmenting that did it. And I've listed some other examples there. The latency is also important. Um, augmenting, for instance, you shouldn't be getting a drug injury, a drug induced liver injury six months after being left. I mean, it's, it's too, too long. The washout has already occurred. That shouldn't happen. But some drugs can take a long time particularly nitrofurantoin, to cause an injury. So a little unclear why that happens, but it's something to, to be aware of. So for us in the network, we do this really for purposes of studies. It can't really do this in clinical practice, but how, how certain are we that this patient has DILI? So we use expert opinion, right? So we every month we meet, we discuss potential cases, and then we decide individually and then by consensus how likely we thought this was, was DILI. Um, and we come up with a, with a, with a, a five-point scale. Uh, I'll show you a couple of slides in a second about a, a computerized method of making this diagnosis. So the RUCAM is some 30 years old now, uh, but it's basically uh, you assign a score based on several criteria, and then the higher the score, the more likely you think it's to be silly. I'll show, you the, I'll show you what that is in a second. So for us, in terms of the network, we use the uh, kind of a, a legal scale, right? Definite, highly pro likely, probable. Uh, based on how likely we think this is to, to occur. If, if we think it's possible, unlikely, then we have to look for another reason. Well, why did this person have a liver injury if we don't think it was silly? The RUCAM, it's a bit like any other the scoring systems people use for other, to, to make a diagnosis for other diseases. So, you know, how long did it take for the injury to start? Did there, was there a D challenge? Did you rule out other things? How, how likely was this drug in the past to have caused an injury, et cetera, et cetera? And then you can get a, a score uh, based on all these domains. And if, if it's a high score, it's more likely to be Dilly than it is. The problem with it, it's like 30 years old. It doesn't really take into account herbal and dietary supplements. So we've just recently published on the RECAM as opposed to the RUCAM. So this is an hepatology from a, a couple of months ago. Uh, and there'll be an app for this as well. So you can put your clinical data into the app and it will spit out a score. Uh, and, the, and the domains are similar to the RUCAM, latency, detailed literature, et cetera.
Uh, but if you compare the two, the recap's a little bit better. And as I say, there, there will be an app for this. In terms of management strategies, so really there isn't much we can offer, right? So the best thing you can do is stop the drug. The problem is sometimes you're not aware that there is an injury until the injury is kind of pretty severe. Uh, but stopping the drug obviously makes, uh, uh, makes a difference because if you carry on and, and the patient uh, was, was unaware, then, then uh, bad things happen. Um, you can mention this. So, you know, uh, NAC or ns cysteine is used as an antidote for acetaminophen liver injury, right? But it also probably works in non-acetaminophen injury. So this is a, from the acute liver, failure study, uh, acute liver failure study group. And it showed that compared to placebo, NAC seemed to help uh, in non-acetaminophen liver injury. So if you have someone with a severe liver injury and you're looking after them, I would give them NAC, right? It, it, does, it does no harm and it might do some good. Um, we're probably going to study this in a, in a better, uh, in a better, uh, in a prospective way, but steroids, you would think, okay, it's a person has a, an acute liver injury. It's, there's a lot of inflammation. Let's just give them steroids. Uh, at least in the acute liver failure study group, it didn't seem to make a difference. I would say, and we'll hopefully prove this when we do our study that in a subset of patients with DILI, steroids probably are helpful, but I wouldn't just give them if, if you're not really certain, because there's a downside to giving high dose steroids. Other than that, there's not much else you can do, right? You can, you can give antidotes to a few examples of DILI, right? So IV carnitine works for valproate liver injury. So pediatricians know this. In, in patients that have a very uh, kind of immunoallergic uh, reaction, steroids probably help. Um, sometimes cholestyramine and ursidio uh, work for, for very cholestatic injuries and obviously transplant for as, as a case that I presented earlier on. But otherwise, we don't have a lot to offer. So let's switch to herbal and dietary supplements. So these are not classified as drugs, right? So this is why they're available so readily, right? So they're vitamins, minerals, dietary and food components, herbs, natural, whatever you want to call them that they supplement your diet. So they're not drugs. The problem is they don't really undergo any kind of safety or efficacy testing because they're a food. So it's easy to get. Uh, and uh, you know, it's always been the fine print at the bottom of the label that this product is not intended to diagnose, cure, treat any disease because the manufacturer has to put that in. The FDA has told them that. It's big business, right? So I'm sure this is out of date, uh, you know, 40 billion, I'm sure it's a hundred billion of, of sales for these things. Uh, and they're, you know, you see them, they're safe, cheap, natural. So people just assume they're, they're good for you, uh, as opposed to expensive and manufactured pharmaceutical compounds. The problem is natural does not mean safe. So this was published uh, um, uh, a, few, a few years ago. If you look at the compounds that we enroll patients with Dili, I mentioned antimicrobials are the number one kind of group. The next group is HDS. And if you look what's happened in terms of the trend, the graph on the left, over time, going from, you know, the initial uh, iterations of Dylan to, to now, HDS is taking up a much bigger slice of the pie. So we're seeing this even more commonly. Maybe we're just more attuned to it, to ask about it. And maybe it's just to do with the, the, the increasing use of these things. If you look in terms of when people have said, well, okay, this stuff is safe and um, it's being sold for X, Y, and Z, maybe we should look at these compounds to see how safe they are and what's actually in them. So uh, the New York Attorney General actually did this, uh, and we've also done this. So what they did is they went to Walmart or GNC or whoever's selling this stuff, took stuff off the shelves, and then analyzed it. And so, you know, if you're taking Jinko Biloba from Walmart, it's basically got powdered radish, houseplants, and wheat in it, even though it's meant to be gluten-free. Um, same thing with, uh, with GNC. And so Walmart uh, was, was cited for this, as was GNC. And as I say, we've done this uh, in Dillon. So what we did is we partnered with uh, a, a, a guy in Mississippi who, uh, it's a mouthful, he, he, he runs uh, a lab that basically analyzes products. Uh, so he does mass specs on products and then can give you a, a printout of what's in the product. So what we did uh, what we do is that when we have a patient like the patient that I presented, when he brings in all the stuff that he took, we collect that stuff, we send it to this, this guy in Mississippi who then analyzes what's in it. So if we look at that as a group, we did this a few years ago now, we, we took 337 
samples of HDS that we had collected from patients that had Dili. Um, and we analyzed, um, okay, what were they used for? But we also analyzed the ingredients. And so what we found was that half the time, what's labeled is not there, or there's extra stuff that's there that's not labeled. So this is a potential problem. So what are the things that, we're, that we look for? We look for things that can cause liver injury, right? So anabolic steroids are a classic cause of uh, a kind of a bland cholestasis. So we look for those, particularly in supplements that are used for you know, weight training or bodybuilding, et cetera, also for weight loss. Uh, but there are other things that we're looking for, including pharmaceuticals, uh, that might be in this natural product. Um, I'll leave this one, but I'll go on to show you an example of mislabeling, right? So this was a 24-year-old uh, man comes in with an acute icteric hepatitis, right? So high transaminases, jaundice, and he'd been taking a bunch of products for muscle pain. So they included, and they always have kind of exotic names, Nano Vapor, Animal Flex, Optimum, Opti, et cetera. So one was called tamoxiclone. So here's a pattern of injury, and you can see that he has kind of uh, a mild kind of transaminitis, outpost is normal, he gets jaundice, and then eventually kind of uh, recovers. And we took the products that he was taking, including this tamoxiclone, and you can see here the, the ingredients for tamoxiclone are listed there, and ND means not detectable. So all the ingredients that were listed there were actually not in the, in the product. And here's our mass spectrometry. And you can see there's a spike of something showing up. And the spike that shows up, actually, is tamoxifen. So this person was taking tamoxiclone, which allegedly had all these ingredients in it for his, for his bodybuilding. But in fact, it had tamoxifen in it. And that corresponds to the liver, the injury that he, that he had corresponds to the liver injury you would get from tamoxifen. So this is an example of mislabeling uh, and also contamination or adulteration. Uh, and this happened with Oxyelite Pro. So we were involved in this and we published on this. And after we published on this, we got subpoenas from the manufacturer of this compound, uh, kind of cease and desist type subpoenas. Uh, we didn't so cease and desist. Uh, and what happened with this compound was that a bunch of people, unfortunately, uh, got sick from taking this for weight loss because it had DMAA, this uh, dimethyl amylamine am in it, uh, and it caused multiple uh, episodes of liver injury, death and liver transplantation in Hawaii, in, in uh, military, right? Because uh, uh, military used this stuff for weight loss as well. They published on it and we published on it. And eventually uh, the government got involved and the, uh, this company uh, and the directors of this company pled guilty uh, and now are in prison. We also published on Kraton. So Kraton, you'll see this, you know, when you look at the national poison data system, they're seeing a dramatic rise in Kraton poisoning, right? Because this is a, 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 a substitute for narcotics. You can buy it. This is CBD oil and all Kraton stores um, because it, it, it's, it's readily available. And we published on this and it shows that similarly with the increase that the national poison uh, data uh, uh, system is seeing, we're seeing an increase in the networks. Makes sense. More people are using it, you're going to get more injury. Um, running a bit short on time, so I want to finish up. So uh, this also, we, we just published recently, green tea extract. You would think this is great, right? Green tea, green tea extract, good for me. Um, but what we showed in this paper is that maybe not so, not so good for you. So this was around about 40 cases of patients that we enrolled that had liver injury that we felt were from green tea extract. And you can see typical female predominance. A lot of them got jaundice, high transaminases, um, and um, almost all of them were, as I mentioned, hepatocellular. But what we also did is then we looked at the HLA associations. And this is important, a little bit of a difficult slide to interpret, but I'll try and explain it. What it shows is that in the cases that we really felt were green tea, we weren't you know, on the fence, we felt this is definitely the uh, injury versus if we were a little bit more on the fence versus if we were kind of, okay, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. The, the, the more we felt it was a clinical uh, injury from green tea extract, the more likely you are to have HLA B3501. So what this shows is that this HLA haplotype is strongly associated with injury to, uh, with uh, green tea extract. Um, uh, and, You'll see, again, the next iteration of the, of the network will, will hopefully enroll some more patients and we'll be able to identify more HLA haplotypes as well as other genetic risk factors 
for, um, for, for doing. So just to almost wrap up, so the current and future projects, hepatitis E I talked about, uh, and um, this is important, and this is one of the reasons we store sera because we may, we may have a patient with an injury which we don't have a test to pick up uh, 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 another alternative diagnosis. So we're looking at all our cases to see if there was hepatitis E infection. Uh, Garcinia is kind of similar to green tea extract, it's something that's used pretty commonly. Genetic studies, I, I talked about the PTMP22, uh, there's things called ERAP1 and 2 that modify your risk. I talked about the RECAM. Uh, so there, as I mentioned, there'll be an app hopefully later this year that you, that you can get that when you have a liver injury, you can put it in and see if, if the RECAM score is high. Uh, we're looking at some other things about highs law. We will hopefully try, start a trial of steroids in severe uh, suspected Billy, uh, and this will be all in, in Dylan 5, which hopefully will get funding from 2023 onwards. Just for the last two minutes, um, I'll show you the, the slide that, that, uh, that, that shows you how you, can, how you can get online with this. So liver tox, if you learn nothing else, and for those of you who already know about this, you'll know how useful this is. Even I use this all the time. So it's an online resource. Uh, for anybody interested in Billy. So what it does, it gives you a general overview uh, and it's got entries, that it says 800 there, it's like more, more like 1300 now. Uh, so it gives you case presentations. So it gives you, okay, you, you, you took doxycycline and you think this patient had an injury from doxycycline. So what does that actually look like? So you can read about it. It gives you what the characteristics are. There's some pathology slides there on some of the cases. And then it links to references and other uh, on, on online resources. And if you're really interested, you can upload your own case onto the, onto the website. So this is what it looks like. Uh, I have to give uh, 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 Jay Hufnagel all the credit because he put this together. Uh, and it's a very useful resource. Gets millions of hits every month. So basically, you can search for your drug and it will give you, as I mentioned, uh, uh, essentially several pages of, of, of literature on this and what, what the injury should look like. Um, so I'll sum up now. So the take home messages should be that Dili is common if you describe it as kind of like mildly elevated liver enzymes, but severe injury is actually quite rare. We've identified like several genetic risk factors, mainly in the HLA region, chromosome six, but there are other polymorphisms in other genes, uh, as well as, as I mentioned, these, these modifying genes that we'll have more information on as we get more cases. Making a diagnosis is still a bit difficult because we have to exclude everything else. These kind of computerized scores, this RUCAM and RECAM uh, will be useful. Everybody likes to have an app on their phone, right? So if you can put that in and, and come up with a, with a score, that would probably be useful. Um, this is kind of where we're going as well as a network. The HDS, because people like that, the government likes it, FDA likes it as well. Um, that We have several interesting findings already with legal, legal ramifications. Uh, and implications and liver tox. If you take nothing else away, visit liver tox uh, because uh, it's, it's a very useful uh, website. Um, just to acknowledge some people. So at Sinai, it's myself, Joe, Odin, Priya, Ray one our coordinators, Umer, and uh, in Dylan, Jay Hufnagel is really the, the mastermind behind all of this, but uh, lots of eminent people at uh, other institutions. And if you have cases of Dili, please email myself or Joe. So even if you suspect, it's easy for me just to look up in Epic. If you have a, a patient that you think has got a liver injury and you think it might be Billy from whatever, just please just email me uh, and I'll, I'll definitely respond. And I'll stop there and, and uh, take questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. I mean, this was uh, fascinating, although a little bit uh, scary at the same time. Um, we'll open the floor to questions. I think there are a couple in the chat that um, that came during your talk. Uh, let's see if you answer these. Do yeah, start getting... from Dr. Borger. That was about getting cases into the registry. Yeah, so the so the the way we do it, um, even if you're we're not on site, it's it's relatively easy for us. Um, to, to, to get the data. We basically need um, kind of obviously talk to the patient and we need like three tubes of blood. Um, if we can't, it's just useful information to have. So just by all means, just 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 email myself or Joe. If you have a case that even if you, it turns out not to be delayed, it's okay. I mean, uh, I'd say much rather I, I, we can discuss and we don't enroll. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That That's very helpful. Dr. Weissman, if I could follow up with a yes, yes, yes. I was uh, different just about question. Yeah, 
Um, as I listened, I, I put that in very early because I was a little shocked that we have this great registry here. And yet down at Beth Israel, where I know myself and many of my colleagues can say we've either had suspected or clinically diagnosed Dilly that sort of did self-resolve and we kind of moved on. Um, to me, in an informatics sort of world, and it's wonderful to see the, uh, that last website, the liver diagnosis website you put up there, that we're not using more of this. Like these are like a lot of the things you're mentioning are sort of things people talk a lot about like, oh yeah, doxycycline can cause this or that. And maybe you see one or maybe you see some mild stuff. But I think that, you know, we do a poor job of collecting all this. And when I think of the power of Sinai and the, and the healthcare system and the reach, is there a way that we could be better about building up the, the not a registry of rare cases, but almost some sort of living, breathing registry that's really interactive and um, that we're kind of getting people the best care in real time, not only banking their blood and all the other stuff, but making sure we're we're always doing the best and the right thing for them because we'll often look to, to our local expertise, which is great. But now hearing about these other resources, is there a way that we could harness the power of the system to do more in things that are probably more common than we think, but everybody kind of writes it off as a one in a million case when it's probably not. No, I agree. Um, so this is only one example, right, Dilly? There's multiple other examples in, in, in liver for, for us. Um, I, I don't know in, in, from a, a system-wide approach how, how we could do it better. I mean, it, one, one thing is just knowing about it, right? So we have people that uh, partly with COVID has also played a role that we, we would have um, twice a year, like a CME-type conference. And, and this is how people, people email me or call me if they have a suspected liver injury because they just know about it, that, that we're interested in it. So it's just getting out there. Uh, and, and letting people know, as I say, I, 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 we, we check email all the time. So if, if you email me, I will respond within, I would say, five or 10 minutes if you have something that you, you want to discuss. Uh, so this is not not just for, for Dilly. Now, doing it in a more kind of a, a systematic way on a system wide, I'm, I'm open to suggestions how we could do that best. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Justin, do you have a question? Um, yeah, thank you so much. This um, was really helpful, Dr. Ahmad. Um, one thing you had mentioned was the Chinese herbal supplements, and I, I've seen two cases here related to that. And one of the challenges I've had is, one, figuring out what's in the supplement, and two, figuring out, like, I think on the on the list, even on liver talks, it's sometimes hard to, to find, um, you know, it, it, if there is, if there's really these, if a lot of a strong relationship with these Chinese supplements, especially when we haven't found another source of the dilly. And do you know if there's been any like collaboration, like in, in places where the use of these supplements is higher, like in China, possibly where we, we have good numbers on like some of these supplements and, and their relationship to dilly? Yeah. So, um, first part of your question about the, you know, making that, that diagnosis. So if you have those cases, for instance, what we try and do is get, get the sample, get the thing that they took, right. Because then we can actually analyze it. Uh, the language barrier we have, uh, like Mandarin and Cantonese, like consent forms. So we can enroll patients and we have enrolled patients with, with, with these Chinese herbal supplements, but it's, it's, that's a whole nother kettle of fish, right? Because the, 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 what's in those things, we only really will know if we were able to analyze them, because even for the, for the compounds made over here or in Europe. In terms of collaboration, we have not done that with, with China. We have collaborations with people in Europe and with people in South Asia, right? So in India. Um, again, I'm open to, and if you look at the literature, the, 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 the Chinese publish a lot on this stuff. Um, and so we just haven't, and they, they, they have their own kind of national registry, even on, on a, on a local basis. And, you know, South America has one, Europe has, uh, the Spanish have one. We haven't done that. And that's maybe something that we should think about. Thank you. And then Dr. Risk asked a question in the chat about uh, people locally who are doing studies on supplements and how would we access that? Dahlia, did you want to ask that directly? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Cause we actually had our, I had two cases of vitamin D toxicity and it's the same thing. We sent the um, specimens. One was like a muscle milk. Uh, the manufacturer of this supplement actually was taking his own supplement 
and he got toxicity and another guy um came in he was actually the guy that made the vidal sassoon movie he overdosed on vitamin d for the labeling and concentration issue we only learned when we sent it to a lab up at mass general um this guy that was a guru in vitamin d and it was a big lesson for me to to hear exactly what you're saying is that none of these are fda regulated none of it we don't really know what's in the supplements we don't know the concentration of the labeling errors there are, it's like a big black box and um, yeah the, you're right so this this will only again i was going to say politics aside but you can't really put it aside this this will only change it when congress acts right and congress won't right. act uh because there are vested interests uh, in the people who manufacture this stuff is there anybody locally, like you, you mentioned the lab in Mississippi, I think many of us have patients on these supplements and are often wondering, you know, what is in them. And um, I've, I've collected things from patients. And have yeah, so really what to do say, we, we don't have anybody locally that I'm aware of that's doing this because it's actually very labor intensive and it's expensive. Yeah. So yeah. The, 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 the person in Mississippi, that's essentially their, their role. Uh, it's the national natural product, something, something, something. Uh, but he, we've we've been collaborating for about for about ten years, and what, one of our again we have six centers. One of the centers is particularly interested in this, so he spearheaded a, a, like a repository of these things. So if you have cases and you have the compound particularly, that's very useful because then we can send it off, and you'll you'll get some data back about what was actually in it. Very interesting. Thanks. All right, uh, Dr. Harrington. Dr. Harrington. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, this is a really, really interesting topic, uh, you know, obviously very clinically relevant. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, that you really covered extensively in this talk was how DILI is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, to firmly make the diagnosis, you know, all other etiologies of acute liver injury must be eliminated. And so my question for you is, you know, from a high value care standpoint, is all of that workup required in every case? You know, I'm specifically thinking of, you know, some of the more kind of workup for maybe more rare autoimmune etiologies, some of the more esoteric lab values that, you know, take a very long time to go and, and may cost a lot of money. If we have a case in which we suspect Dilly, maybe we have a, uh, you know, one of the agents that you showed as being a relatively frequent or common cause of it. If we have a case in which we sort of suspect Dilly, do we need to do this, you know, extensive work for esoteric etiologies? No, is the answer. Uh, so it will depend on, it, it, it's a little bit of a case by case basis, right? So for instance, if you have um, uh, a patient that took augmentin, right, and had uh, a cholestatic injury, right, outpost of 800, Billy goes up. The likelihood that that's going to be acute hepatitis C is going to be very low, right? So um, th there's really no need to get hepatitis C RNA. Probably uh, ACB antibody is enough. It's no, there's no need to do hepatitis E testing, right? So hepatitis E testing in the last, I don't know, three, four years, it's, it's more, you can get it on Epic, uh, not the RNA, but you can you definitely do the antibody and IgM as well. Um, so it's probably not necessary. But if you have a case that's uh, a, a hepatocellular, right, you really need to do hepatitis C RNA tests. Because again, we published on this that you think, okay, there's no risk factor, but it, it was probably from the dentist or probably from some sort of other uh, procedure the patient had somewhere locally that they got acute hepatitis C because the, 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 there's evidence that we had serial studies actually on these uh, patients that we stored serial that showed that it was acute hepatitis C. Similarly, if you have a cholestatic injury, you probably should get better imaging uh, than just like an ultrasound, particularly if it's not getting better, right? Because maybe there's the damage to the biliary tree, so you probably should do an MR. So it will be based on, you're right, what the type of injury it is and what you think is the su suspect drug, right? So similarly, INH, right? The patient has got latent TB and is on INH and has an acute hepatocellular, hepatocellular injury uh, with jaundice. They don't really need an MRI, right? They don't need an MRCP. So it, it, you don't need to do it. We, we do it. Purely because we're kind of, it's a research study, right? So we want as much data as, as, as we can. But in terms of for you, and this will be for the for the recam when it comes out, you'll you'll see the when you input the data, you, you basically get slightly higher points. But for you to make a diagnosis, you've already reached that because you had a, a drug that's classic injury and you had the correct latency. So the added points you get because you excluded X, Y, and Z doesn't actually help you that much because you already made the diagnosis. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions, comments from the audience? All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Please email me, right? For anything. Okay. Will do. Take care. Thank you so much, Thanks. Dr. Amade, for the amazing and very informative talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.